when people talk about the West Coast additions of the Big Ten for this season, they mention Washington, they mention Oregon, they mention USC, and they kind of brush UCLA to the side. You might want to keep an eye on the Bruins for this season and the future. Will Decker, host of the Bruin Bible as part of the LA Football Network, joins me to preview all things 2024 UCLA Bruins football. From LA to Piscataway, all Big Ten, all year long. This is Big Ten 10. Have no fear, the UCLA Bruins are here. It's their first year in the Big Ten Conference, and boy, are they going through a lot as they transition from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten to talk all things 2024 UCLA Bruins. We bring in our guy, Will Decker, host of the Bruin Bible Podcast as part of the LA Football Network. All right, Will, there's a lot to get into. There's a lot to dissect with UCLA, but here's where I want to start with. In February, Chip Kelly, there were rumblings the months before that of will he stay or will he go? Will the administration possibly make a move? He elected to go become the offensive coordinator at Ohio State. Not exactly the best time. After two signing periods, kind of in the middle of a transfer portal period there in February, and they hire a position coach, but not just any position coach, a guy that loves those four letters, a UCLA legend in Deshaun Foster over there becomes the head man um, of this Bruins program. So you could see maybe mixed feelings, definitely mixed feelings outside um, of UCLA, those around Big Ten country, maybe some criticism surrounding the move, but what is the overall confidence? What is the overall feeling of Foster taking over this program? Because Deshaun Foster, in his short time as head coach, he's been able to do something that Chip Kelly didn't really want to do, and that's recruit. Yeah, and first and foremost, Ted, thanks for having me on, man. Always down to talk some Bruins and Big Ten football. Uh, the vibe around Deshaun Foster uh, was a name we floated out there because of what the job ultimately meant to him. Uh, a little nervous on paper, I think UCLA fans felt. Position coach. And, you know, he had not been an offensive coordinator, had not – had any coordinating experience leading to that head coaching job. But what he can do is he can sell UCLA like no other, and they've been able to hire a staff around him that allows him to keep himself at his strengths, which is kind of the CEO of a football team, which is kind of the way, uh, you know, in a lot of universities and, you know, teams nowadays are kind of having their football programs be. An overseer of the program, they hired Eric Bieniemy, which was a huge get uh, as offensive coordinator. For those who don't know who Bieniemy is, this guy was an offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs in the heyday of the Patrick Mahomes and Kelsey era. Like, this is a legitimate dude to bring on the staff. They hire Juan Castillo, longtime uh, Andy Reid offensive line coach. You get a lot of Andy Reid guys. Okaika Malloy takes the defensive coordinator position after losing DeAnton Lynn. So I think the general consensus is they've surrounded him with the coaching staff necessary for him to succeed. Was a little nervous at first, but Deshaun's done everything right uh, since taking the job. And I think the fan base is very encouraged with his first few months on the job. So let's head into this football team and let's start on the offensive side of the ball. Now, I did say Chip maybe didn't like recruiting, but he was able to bring in Dante Moore last year. Colin Schley was also a guy, kind of more of a running quarterback that transferred in. Now, both of those guys, of course, are gone. But as part of this revolving door at quarterback last year, you also had Ethan Garbers, who balled out in that L.A. Bowl against Boise State, and when he got the playing time and he was healthy, he was a quarterback that certainly showed some flashes uh, last year in this Bruins offense under Chip Kelly uh, in 2023. Now with the spotlight and the confidence in the coaching staff behind Ethan Garbers saying, hey, you're the guy, do you think that's going to propel him to kind of new heights in 2024 as the leader of this offense? I think so. There's a lot of factors out there that we'll get to uh, pertaining to Ethan Garbers and his success moving forward. But, you know, two things I really look at in a young quarterback. How did he do against his rival? He beat USC last year. He outdueled Caleb Williams, you know, the number one overall pick in the draft last year, right? And then the LA Bowl. He won the first bowl game for UCLA in over six, seven years. So this guy is a fantastic option at quarterback. We didn't get to see him at his full potential last year with the revolving quarterback door as it was last year. Dante Moore 
was too good for a lot of people in their minds to keep him on the bench last year. And then Colin Schley was a legitimate starter at Division One University at Toledo the year before. He was battling for a job there as well. So with all that being said, 11 touchdowns, two interceptions, got big victories. I'm expecting this is the kind of the year he's laid the framework for him to have the confidence and you know all the tools he needs to be very successful his first year in Big Ten. I'm going to make a prediction. I think he's going to shock a lot of people by how good he can potentially be in the Big Ten in some of these ball games. Now you talk about predictions in terms of being good and really being a surprise for Big Ten fans. I think a big reason why he could have that production is what they have coming back at the wide receiver position and what they're bringing in at the wide receiver position. This is low-key, maybe a top five, top six wide receiver room, or at least a wide receiver top three in the Big Ten Conference. You return your top two leading receivers from last year, J. Michael Sturdivant, Logan Loya, kind of that slot guy over there as well. And then you bring in a transfer that I'm personally very excited about. Enrico Flores that had around 400 receiving yards in his freshman year at Notre Dame. He was highly recruited, four-star type of kid coming out of high school. And after one year in South Bend, he decides to come to the sunny beaches and transfer into Westwood. That is a really good group um, at wide receiver right now. How explosive do you think can they be? And kind of how much can they help out Ethan Garbers, like we mentioned before? I said it last year, and with the addition of Rico Flores, I'm going to double down and say it again. This is the deepest receiving core I've ever seen as someone that's covered UCLA football. Mm. And traditionally, when you think of receivers in college football in Los Angeles, it's usually that other school across town, whether yeah. it's your Amon Ross St. Browns, your Michael Pittman, Marquise Lee Aguilar, Mike Williams, Keyshawn. We could go on for a long time. Not a lot of big names when it comes to UCLA. We had a couple in the 90s, but not a lot of big names really since the 2000 turn. This group is deep, man. Logan Loyal, leading receiver back. He's kind of like your typical slot guy that can take the top off the defense. Uh, for those that want to see a clip, we upset Utah at the Rose Bowl a couple of years ago, the Pac-12 champion Utah. Uh, and a big reason as to why is Logan Loyal had a 76-yard touchdown catch to kind of ice the game there. J. Michael Sturdivant, he really was one of the more talented players in the transfer portal. One of my favorite draft guys, Dane Brugler. Had him as a top five wide receiver going into the college football season for the NFL draft. Six foot three, 205, very explosive. Had 700 plus yards receiving, seven touchdowns at Cal. We were supposed to build on that last year, but the endless carousel of quarterbacks, weak <laughs> offensive line play really prevented him from you know exploding to what we thought he could be. The line, fingers crossed, looking a little bit more improved. Garbers and him had a chemistry. LA Bull, four catches, 142 yards and a touchdown. If Sturdivant has that connection going with Garbers moving into this year, he's going to be a hell of a player. Rico Flores, as you mentioned, man, we had high expectations for this kid coming in. I mean, he had offers from Georgia, Ohio State, and high school. He is the most refined route runner this room has, and he's going to be a true sophomore. I mean, it's very, very impressive what this kid does. You can kind of, you know, eye test it. Is this guy a pro? Is he not? Rico Flores with his habits, the way he works, how intense he is on the practice field. And not only that, the separation he can create in the open field, he's got mitts his hands. I think Rico Flores is really going to make a jump here as wide receiver three uh, at UCLA. And that's saying a lot with this receiving group. Titus Mokiawa, Atim Alala is coming back as well. This is a guy that went to UCF, but he had offers from Alabama coming out of Hawaii. Braden Pagan's a kid that has been a practice all-star for UCLA that has not really seen his time at UCLA, but is a monster on the football field. There's just a lot of guys in this UCLA room, and Ethan Garbers is going to have a lot of weapons to kind of showcase his ability as a passer this year. Well, you were getting me pumped up for UCLA football, specifically that passing game, uh, Will. It, it's something certainly to watch out for here in Big Ten circles. But let's move from the pass game to the run game because we talked about that USC game in the Coliseum where the Bruins were able to go in there and establish their will at the line of scrimmage with the run game. TJ Harden, 828 yards rushing last season, eight touchdowns. To put it into perspective, the Big Ten's leading rusher, Kyle Manangai, also rushed for eight touchdowns uh, last season. Can this be, can he be a 1,000 yard back? Can he be a bell cow type of back and, and really take his game into the next stratosphere and add a balance to this offense where it's kind of pick your poison? I totally believe so. And 
you know, what you can say about Deshaun Foster, I think the naysayers would say, hey, man, he's not experienced. I don't know how he became head coach, all this stuff. I'm kind of on the more positive outlook, given how we've seen. The one position group you cannot mess with with Deshaun Foster is <laughs> the running back room. He was arguably up there with the best running back coaches within all of college football. If you look yeah. at how the players he's produced to the NFL, uh, I definitely think he can be a 1,000-yard rusher. I'll put it to you this way. 156 carries last year, 827 yards. He wasn't even the top carry getter on the team last year. Yeah. Nearly went for 1,000 last year. Carson Steele doing that. He's very, very explosive. He would be the type of guy where he may have – four or five carries for, you know, six or seven yards. Then he breaks that 40 to 50 yard run. He's a home run hitter out there in the football field. I'm very, very high on the potential of what he can be. Uh, We got Keegan Jones coming back, all purpose running back. This guy was more of a, you know, receiver out of the backfield last year. But one of the reasons he actually transferred, he was on his way to UConn. Deshaun becomes the head coach. Deshaun gives him a call like, hey, we need you back. Keegan gets on the first flight back to LA, coming back to the UCLA Bruins, very explosive as well. These guys are two very quick players. Uh, we tried to get a third running back in that transfer portal. I think we needed that for depth. But the guy I think we're kind of relying on at this point is transfer portal is kind of the end of its bits right here, is what I would say is this guy, Cameron Jones, keep an eye out for this guy. St. John's Bosco is one of the more proud high school programs within Southern California. Yeah. 210 pounds. This guy is has the body type to produce immediately at the college level four-star running back on some services. So Cameron Jones would be the third guy, but Harden, I mean, if, if he puts all the tools together, he is more than qualified to be a thousand yard rusher in the big 10. I know those defenses are daunting, but I just believe in Harden that much. I watched that USC game and I'm like, that's a downhill back. That is a big 10 running back right there. I think I tweeted it in the middle of that game when he was really um, going at that Trojan defense. Now, as we know here in Big Ten country, if you want a 1,000-yard running back, you got to have the big boys up front. You got to have the offensive line. There are three players on this Bruin offensive line that started all 13 games at their respective position. A familiar name to Big Ten fans, former Purdue Boilermaker Spencer Holstich at left guard. You're looking at Josh Carlin at right guard. You're looking at Garrett DiGiorgio over there at right tackle. And all three of these guys were a part of an offensive line that paved the way for the top run game in the Pac-12 conference last year. They bring in a transfer in Michael Cormody coming over from Notre Dame that was highly touted that a lot of people are excited about um, in Bruin circles uh, as well. We talked about the skill positions. And the skill positions look like they're very good at UCLA this season. Do you think that this offensive line could be the final piece? Because you said it might be a little bit, you know, maybe a little bit unsure in some spots, maybe a little bit of optimism in other spots. How do you view the offensive line kind of paving the way for the rest of this offense? Yeah, it's it's a tough question to answer because through spring ball, the line looked very chaotic. But I want to preface okay. that by Carmody had not yet been on campus yet. Right. They also added two very high-quality players in Ruben Unige coming from Houston, uh, who started opposite an NFL tackle at uh, for the Houston Cougars. And then you got uh, Alani Makaheli, who came in as a guard and started 13 games for UNLV. So you're going to add potentially three starting-level players to that unit as well, which kind of eases the concern. The run game was great. They really struggled in pass last year. The pass protection – was not great. They were top 15 in the country in sacks allowed last year, which is not a great stat to have. Uh, yes, we had young quarterbacks, you know, Dante Moore, who would, you know, at times it looked like he was a little scared to pull the trigger on some of these passes and make mistakes that led to some sacks. But overall, the play was not great. So adding new guys in there is a big deal. New offensive line coach in, old one out, Tim Drevno left. We got Juan Castillo in. Um, it's, it's kind of the missing piece of the offense, if you will. I, I feel very confident saying we're going to be able to move the ball, you know, in football if we have the offensive line solidified. That's a big question, though, at this point in time. So a lot of bodies coming in. Can they fortify it? Even with those guys, the center is a big issue. We lost a four-year starter in Duke Clemens, uh, who's moving on to the NFL. Uh, so if they can get the center right and get, you know, at least two of these three transfers in there to make a difference, I think it can shore up and be a B-minus group at best and make this offense as good as possible. 
And we know how important the offensive line, once again, got to hammer home that point. We know how important the offensive line is to success here in the Big Ten Conference. Well, a lot of optimism there with offense. Will, we got to go to the other way when we talk about defense because holy cow, is there a lot of change. Danton Lynn came in last year for one season at UCLA after some time in the National Football League, and he turned this defense into somewhere around the 80s into close to a top 10 defense this is one of the best defenses in the country one of the best defenses uh in the pac-12 conference as well you're losing of course lynn we mentioned as the defensive coordinator how about liatu latu the top defensive player drafted in this year's nfl draft the lombardi award winner as well gabriel murphy was second in tfls and sacks alex johnson led the team in interceptions with five john humphrey and kamari ramsey they transfer across town Over to USC, I'll lose my breath if I continue kind of talking about all of these other guys. But what do you expect out of this UCLA Bruins defense that looks completely revamped and completely brand new here in 2024? They've got some talent still there. Uh, I mean, you're not going to replace the Liatu Latu overnight. The Murphys, I know they went without getting drafted, but they were very effective players within the Pac-12 uh, you know, you lose a Darius Muwasau, who was like the heartbeat of this defense. I never felt like he got the credit nationally that he deserved because the D-line was so dominant, but Muwasau yeah. was such a huge part of that defense. Uh, but here's what I will say about the defense. Interior D-line is going to be one of our strengths. Jay Toya, a guy that initially tested the transfer portal waters, it was a high six-figure offer for him to go to Texas. Yeah. He was weighing it heavily. Ended up coming back to UCLA. This guy is a baller, legit NFL talent at the defensive tackle position, former four-star back in high school. Uh, Went to USC, ironically, but then transferred to UCLA. Uh, He's going to be making a big difference. We saw the flashes of what he can be. If he is healthy this year, I think Toya will make a case of being a top 15 defensive tackle within college football this year. I, I totally believe that. Keanu Williams, who's lined up next to him. Spring football, he made a lot of plays. Former four-star transfer coming down from Oregon. Uh, this guy is a baller as well. And at his best, he is lined up next to Toye, who takes the bulk of the attention away. Keanu does his thing by allowing to get through him. So I feel very confident about those two guys lining up. We also have a veteran, Gary Smith, who transferred from Duke in there as well. Um, the edge rushers I'm a little bit more nervous about. You know, mm-hmm. one of our top guys out of camp was uh, Jacob Busich, who's from Navy. Not necessarily a top flight D1 football school. You know, salute to service. I love Navy, but you can't hang your hat on maybe your number one pass rusher being from Navy if you guys want to get home to the quarterback. One name to watch out for, though, and we were not able to see him in spring football. He's banged up a little bit. This guy can swing the in total D line as a whole. Collins a champion. This guy transferred in from Miami. And when I tell you I've never seen a football body quite like this guy's, Six foot seven, 270. He looks like a basketball player out there. <laughs> Massive human being. Collins a champion coming off the edge. He, he has all the tools to be successful. Was a high four star kid. Moved over here, uh, you know, to the United States in early high school. Just picked up the game recently, but coaches have been raving about his natural ability and what he could potentially be on the field. This is a guy that, you know, if he gets out there uh, and, you know, gets kind of a couple starts under his belt early, gets comfortable. He can really, really make a difference for UCLA out there. So that's a guy I look at. I I feel good about the defensive line, linebacking room. Deeper than you would think. You know, we lost to Mwastow. Kane Madrano really took a jump last year. And, you know, I I don't know if I've seen a player at UCLA make a bigger jump. I think people forget this guy started off as a wide receiver when he got to UCLA. Becomes a linebacker. The Utah game. And Utah, you have to understand from a Pac-12 fan standpoint, that was the team over the last two to three years. They were yeah. back-to-back Pac-12 champions before last year in Washington. We went to Utah's house, and Kane Madrano, two sacks, ten tackles. When you ball out against them, that's a different level of confidence moving forward. He played very, very well. We like what we've seen from him. Olafemi Oladeja, very talented player from Cal. He's had some of his best games against his biggest opponents. I mean, against Notre Dame, he had 14 tackles against them in his freshman year. Um, came out to UCLA. The stats don't reflect it, but that linebacking room with Madrano, Wausau, there just wasn't enough tackles for everybody there. You know what I mean? It was a a crowded linebacking room. They may experiment with him coming off the edge because he's very explosive, 
Um, so that's a name to watch out for. The other guy, this guy was a – I looked at the PFF page. You actually retweeted this, Ted. John John Vons, our linebacker who played baseball, he was the fourth yep. highest graded linebacker for PFF, you know. Yep. And here's the thing. He's a baseball player, so we don't know if he's going to go into the draft. He's a very talented baseball player. As three or four of those five tool players you kind of described you on the baseball diamond. So if he comes back, we're feeling good. And here is here's the great unknown. It's Ali Kehau. This guy was a former five-star player from Alabama, transferred here two years ago, played in our opening two games in 2021, and has largely been injured the last two years. You know, I don't want to say I'm getting shades of law to here because the storyline <laughs> is very, very similar if you follow it is, but this is a guy that's finally cleared and finally healthy to play. If he's anything close to that talent that got him to Alabama, that got him that high ranking, that's just in another dude you can put in that linebacking room, right? So that is a big name player. And then what I will say, anyone that followed Chip Kelly, uh, you know, within the secondary, that was his Achilles heel. That was, I mean, he could not get the secondary right. Uh, the unit is as about as stable as it's been in a long time. Cody Whitfield, one Pac-12 secondary coach last year. Uh, you got Jalen Davies. You got Devin Kirkwood. Kirkwood is this highly touted four-star corner on the outside for UCLA. And he has had a lot of inconsistencies, but very similar to Garbers on the offensive ball, side of the ball. Made the jump of the USC game. Kirkwood made a huge confidence building interception on Caleb Williams, of all people, in that USC-UCLA game. And he played very well the rest of the season. So if he can translate that moving forward, I'm feeling confident. We got, uh, you know, Ramon Henderson coming from Notre Dame, competing for that starting safety spot. Brian Addison coming from Oregon. We got guys back there. I feel confident with Cody Whitfield. Is the defense going to be as good as it was last year? Probably not. But I think they're competent enough to keep UCLA in some ball games they shouldn't be in. You know how great of a professional Will Decker is? He just went through four bullet points. Four questions on the rundown for this show, and I absolutely love it. There are players coming back on this UCLA defense at all levels. You talk about Tayoya um, in the middle. You talk about the linebacker room with Madrano. You talk about Kirkwood and Davey. So it seems like coming back from last year, guys who were a part of a really good defense, there's veterans at each level of the defense. It's just what about these transfers? What about these new guys kind of filling the, the gaps? I think that will be uh, the big question. Let's move on to the schedule because yeah. this is a UCLA team. When I kind of look at them, I look at their offense, I get excited. Maybe some returning pieces on defense. Okay, maybe this could be a bowl team, which I think would be a big victory for Deshaun Foster um, in year number one. But after f- opening games against Hawaii and Indiana, man, UCLA might have the toughest three-game stretch in college football. When you talk about going on the road to Baton Rouge to face the LSU Tigers, you get a home game against the Oregon Ducks, but then you got to go on the road to Penn State. LSU and Penn State, two of the toughest road environments in all of college football. Considering that, it's it's going to be tough to be above 500 right during those first five games. What is the expectation? What would you say is success? What does it look like early in those first half of the season? So early in the first half of the season, I'm looking at the schedule. Hawaii's got to be a win. Yeah. Uh, Indiana, you know, not a downplay in anything they're building there. Uh, you know, the James Madison, former coach, coming in there for Indiana. I think that's got to be a win, too, if you're expecting to get to where they're going. Right. You saw the stat that I saw where in terms of returning talent, UCLA ranks in the top 25 in terms of mm-hmm. percentage-wise of programs. And they made a bowl game last year. So Deshaun – this is his words, not mine. He's openly stated anything less than a bowl game is a complete failure. Hmm. So you got to win the first two. LSU, Oregon, Penn State. I mean, I'm very optimistic about UCLA football. I cover them for a living. <laughs> I don't believe we're going to win any of those games. I'm going to be very frankly honest. Penn State is a nightmare on the road. I think LSU is the toughest place you can play in college football. And as we talked the previous time we talked, Oregon's a legitimate national title contender. They might be the best team of all those three that we just mentioned. So I don't expect to win any of those. The key for me is you go back from Penn State. You got to have your head on a swivel because I think a lot of these are momentum-based. Three straight losses in any sport, any, you know, environment, that's tough to kind of get the momentum back on track with a losing streak like that. 
If they can come back and beat Minnesota, they go out to Rutgers the following week, which is a complete cross-country affair. Rutgers, as you've mentioned, very good on defense, yeah. very underrated. Greg Schiano is just a hell of a coach. I just want to tip my cap to him on that. If you can come back and win those two, you can get to four and three when you head into Nebraska November 2nd at Memorial Stadium, which I'll be honest, Nebraska, a lot of people having the dark horse in the Big Ten. I don't know if that's a win for us either. Um, if you can get to four and three heading into Nebraska, maybe four and four for your first eight, I think that's success. And what I'd say to people uh, that are watching UCLA is, man, if UCLA does get to a bowl game, first year with Deshaun Foster, knowing all the you know missing pieces, the inexperience, man, you guys better watch out because, I mean, if Deshaun's <laughs> doing this, if he's recruiting this well right now before the yeah. success has transpired in the field, bowl game year one for Foster in L.A., sleeping giant. I think he's going to get a lot more talent coming his way to UCLA. And the thing about a bowl game, and not many people really realize this, is those extra bowl practices, those extra two weeks of practices, specifically for your young guys, because now you get a lot of those upperclassmen, those NFL type of guys opting out, and then it's time for those young guys to really step in. Hey, now you're getting number one reps. Like we saw it for the USC Trojans last year when a lot of those guys opted out. You saw a lot of those freshmen, a lot of those sophomores. They got got reps in practice. And then they, they balled out uh, in the bowl game against Louisville. And that's why that bowl game is, is so important to be able to get those extra practice practices for those development uh, as well. Now, when you look at the back half of the schedule, there aren't any gimmies like you talked about. What is the expectation overall, I would say, for this team of the first season in the Big Ten? You mentioned Deshaun Foster saying bowl game or bust this season. But as you look at it and as the fans look at it, what would you say are your expectations for UCLA? I think they'll be hovering around five to seven wins. Okay. And then maybe – you know, the bowl game, who knows where that goes. Um, I think SC is very beatable. I think they've got talented players. They beat them last year, and I would argue we have more returning talent than USC does coming back in a lot of ways. Uh, Fresno State, I mean, UCLA fans are going to be triggered even hearing that word. Mm. We've lost three straight games <laughs> to Fresno State over the years. Jeff Tedford, another great coach out there, formerly of Cal. Um, that's the last game. It's kind of a trap game. They're going to have to kind of bring their A game for that. I think I could see us winning that one. Washington, I mean, we talked about it. Jed Fish, in phenomenal coach. I mean, what he did at Arizona is one of the more underrated jobs I think I've seen in college football in a long time, from where he started with them to where he finished with them. Um, I just don't really know a lot about Washington, as we talked about. So I, it's hard for me to gauge what that's going to be. It's at Husky Stadium, so they're going to have a home field advantage in that game. Um, and then Iowa, I, I think – with that game, that defense is going to be so, so talented, so physical. You know what you're going to get from a Kirk Ferentz team. However, I mean, if T.J. Harden's able to break an early one, it doesn't take a lot of points to beat Iowa, as we can we can commend on that, because that yeah. offense has been very frustrating at times. So if they can get out to early starts against those teams, you know, call me crazy. I think if they can go 4-4 four and four in the first eight, there's a there's a path where that last four games they can win three of four of those games and uh, you know really go into the next season with a lot of momentum recruiting wise and on the recruit. Fresno State opens the season at Michigan, ends the season at UCLA. So not exactly the most the easiest. They have a tougher uh, schedule than uh, than uh, UCLA this year. Is what yeah, I <laughs> not God. exactly the the easiest non conference schedule for the Bulldogs this year. Will, it's always great to talk UCLA football. You are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the boys and the four letters and those guys playing football in Westwood. It should be a fun year. UCLA is a team that a lot of people from I've heard from people in Big Ten country they're kind of pushing them off to the side. Well, yeah, I guess UCLA is joining the conference as well but as we laid out throughout the season preview they got some pieces they got some pieces and maybe could surprise some people um, in a few games this year will i'm sure we'll talk to you down the road will decker from the bruin bible at the la football network thanks so much ted thanks for watching big 10 ted where it's all big 10 all year long Make sure to like the video to spread the word of Big Ten Ted to the masses and subscribe to the channel for updates on Big Ten content that drops every day.